everybody! I'm Lauren and this is Richard and we're back doing our tank streams. If um, you watched the last Tanks vs. Zombies stream that we did, we made our tank on, our turret child actor, and we started getting those set up so that you've got a little blue tank that you can place in your level. That's right, and let's see, we are not in that level so let's get to there. It was just untitled, I believe. There, ah, there's our tank. All right, so. Okay, so uh, there's our little blue tank. We've placed it, and let's just remember what we had here. Nothing. Okay, good. <laughs> we just placed, the tank. We placed the tank. The tank exists. That's it. We're still using the default pawn fly around mode. Um, okay, so let's go to our code then. And we're gonna and actually. Well, we could do it the cool way, which is over here. And open Visual Studio in the file menu. Yes, um, and let's put that onto the screen where people can see it. All right. So the next thing we're gonna do is make it so we can actually drive our tank around, right? Or at least possess our tank. Uh, actual? Hmm. Yes, and also we're gonna to need to see our tank to do that. So there's a whole bunch of uh, pawn stuff we're gonna to need to do uh, right up front. Okay. Um. Oh, whoops! I don't have that button. Let's go in here. All right. Uh, so we don't have a camera. Oh, right. And so once we possess our pawn, we wouldn't be able to see ourselves, which wouldn't be very exciting. So we're probably gonna want a camera. Um. All right. Let's make it let's just that. So we're going to want a view camera component. This, by the way, is going to be a property, but it doesn't have to be just yet. So we'll just start it here, and then we'll, we'll move it to being a property uh, momentarily. We also should have a spring arm, right? So the camera has some, like, we can have it lag behind the tank if we want it to, things like that. Yeah, um, that's a really good practice. Uh, if, if you just attach the camera component directly to the tank, it will feel really, really stiff uh, as soon as you start to control it. Uh, the spring arm component is is pre-made. I mean, it's 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 an Epic supplied component, so it's really easy for you to drop in and it has a bunch of little parameters that you can tweak in probably a minute or two to make your camera feel not awful. Um, it's shocking how much worse your camera will feel with no spring arm than you know you just rigidly attach it than it does if it has just the littlest bit of lag. I don't know. It just feels. Do you like that move, by the way? That. That's lag. <laughs> um, so yeah, lag feels good in some cases, and, and this is one of them. So all right, fine. We'll 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 do the camera component in a second. We can start with the spray arm component, and this will also um, actually no, this one we're not going to make a component. Yeah, because the because you don't have to, and I think we just wanted to show both. Right. Um, okay, so we're going to call it spring arm because it's a local variable, and I don't care. So uh, create default sub object. Where are you? There you are. And I guess it's going to be of this type. Yeah, so because the spring arm we're not going to manipulate in our blueprint, we can actually just dynamically create the component here without making it a property. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be nice if we didn't know um, we need a name for it. Um, I don't even think we need to put the text macro, but I'm in the habit of doing it. It's good practice. So uh, oh, if this were an F string, we would need to. It's an F name. That's why I think we might not need to. but. Like you said, it's a good practice. Do it anyway. Um, all right. So I happen to be pretty familiar with these things because I've worked with them for a while. So I'm just going to set the the properties that I want uh, right here in code. If we wanted this to be artist editable or anything like that, then it would be a U property, and we would go through the usual the usual route. But since we know exactly what we want, right. And if you guys are following along, or you follow along with this later, and you want to try manipulating, say the arm length or the lag speed and seeing what kind of a different feel that gives, um, you would just change these properties right here in the code. We're going to be using an orthographic camera, so the target arm length doesn't matter too much. Although since we did vertically offset the sprites from each other to make sure that one appears, you know, is drawn over top of another, 500 will basically limit us to, you know, how far you can yeah, run. how many stacks of sprites we can, we can make and that sort of thing. But this is a game with that takes place in an open field with no ceilings, no walls the camera could clip against, nothing like that. So it's kind of arbitrary, and it's an orthographic camera, so the distance, you know, it's not a perspective camera where going further up... A longer arm would change how everything is. Yeah, it would, would, would shrink things down. It's whatever. 500 is a good number. Um, <laughs> the moral of the story is that... Oh, and it put a space in there for me. I didn't want a space there. All right, so spring arm... All right, camera lag speed defaults to 10. Um... That was a little too much. Mm -hmm. was, that, that wasn't quite the right number we wanted. We, we tinkered with it a little bit. We got two. Two felt pretty good. Um, similarly, we don't need 
to do collision tests. There's there's nothing to collide with. There's no danger of you getting into geometry. It's not like we're doing a an indoor game or anything. So that yeah. doesn't need to be there. Right now we're still working the default level, but once the level we have planned to do is still going to be this very open free space um, level. Um, of course, we do actually want the light to be turned on, just making sure. Uh, let's do that. Um, and there's also camera rotation lag. That makes sense. So I, you have the translation and rotation separate, separate yeah. on the lag. And we're going to, I think we turn that off, don't we? It looks like we do. Mm, yes, we do. Because the camera won't rotate. Um, in our game, the camera's not going to, when you turn the tank, the camera's not going to turn with you. Um, and the reason is that we want the tank to aim at where your mouse cursor is on the screen. So we don't want that to change constantly. We would rather have the tank rotate around on the screen and the screen sort of stay fixed. And that's why we also are not going to use the um, pawn control rotation, right? Uh, that is also right. So let's do that. We don't care what way the tank is facing. Camera faces the way the camera faces, not the way the pawn faces. OK, so all that's pretty much set up. Um, now we do need to attach it. And our root component is that tank direction that we had before so that we can always indicate what direction our tank is facing. So the spring arm will follow along with that. Right. OK, um, that's it. Oh, and then finally, is it set world? Yeah, set, set world, world rotation. rotation. Right, so as an absolute, whatever, whatever that root component's rotation is, don't care. Um, we want to be looking at pitch. Negative 90, uh, which is straight down, no yaw, and no roll. And that's just because of how we oriented our level and what we decided, you know, we were doing a top-down tank and how we oriented that with the level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we want, the, we want the camera looking straight down all, all the time. Uh, so there you go, that'll set that. Um, now we can do our camera component. So for that, I'll just go right over here and, um, and put that in here. Uh, did we make this? I think we made this private. Yeah, yeah basically did. the same sort of setup that we did for our other components. So as you see on our last stream, we did set up that arrow component for our tank direction, the tank sprite to show basically the body of our tank, and then the child actor component to handle spawning in our turret actor um, when we started playing. So we're not really going to mess with this a whole lot in the, uh, in the game either, so I'm just going to make it visible everywhere. That's really all we need. Um, I don't even think we would need to reference this ever, but just in case we wanted to do something like I don't know, find out where the camera is because we're going to blow up everything that's in the middle of the screen or something. And so you, you ask where the camera is. Or we could also make it um, blueprint read write if for some point, or if at some point we made our level, um, like we put our tile set down, we're like, oh, it needs just a little bit of tweaking. Let's just do that in blueprint so that when you go back and code. Yeah. yeah, 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 possibly if we could have a zoom out or a zoom in during the game, yeah. something like that. So just in case we want it for something, we'll make it blueprint read only. I don't want you setting what the camera component is, but if you need to get it and look at it for something, that's fine. Um, just like a little bit of future proofing there. And let's see. Just gonna put it in with everything else. And the meta tag on this uh, for, I'm just going to copy this from two lines up because I don't want that. So. <laughs> and I remember we got a question actually about why the meta keywords are like this separate key value set compared oh, yeah. to like blueprint read only or um, visible anywhere that are just, just the keywords themselves. Uh, yes, and the reason, this is the camera that we're doing, right? Yes. Um, and the reason for that is because they can be, uh, they can be sort of anything. They're, it's more like how you'd see uh, an argument in an XML sheet or like a web page or something like that, where it's, it's sort of up to interpretation, um, rather than like blueprint, like for example, like blueprint read only or blueprint implementable or it's something like that. It's only applied to a property or to a function, not kind of across the board. Yeah, those are specific things that the engine has really specific meanings for. And a lot of the meta tags mean things in the engine too, but there could also be other meta tags. It's, it's more extensible this way, uh, since it's not dealing with specific, you know, has to be this way or has to be that way kind of functionality. Uh, it's a little more open to uh, interpretation, I guess you'd call it. All right, most creative name <laughs> I've ever come up with there. There we go, and I can't type it right. All right, so that we don't, that's not a local variable. But we're still going to create uh, create it as usual. Is, did I not save the other file? Maybe that's why it doesn't know it's there yet. I think it might just take a second. I know that sometimes um... it's not recognizing yet. Okay, well it'll catch up. This is a new camera component. I know we haven't really noticeably done it. slower when uh, 
Yes? Uh, I would say we haven't really done that much um, look and feel wise to our camera. We might just mostly just put it in so that we'd be able to actually start using our tank as something possessable. You know, we didn't put any visual effects on it or anything like that. Yep, so this is going to need to attach to our spring arm. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do this before, but the second argument you can see there in the argument list, I'll leave that up for another second, is the socket name. We're not going to go past that, but uh, the spring arm class conveniently. See, if I just attach it to the spring arm component directly, it would be at the base of the spring arm, which... Would be, then why would you have a spring arm? Yeah, it kind of defeats the point. But uh, within the spring arm component class, there is a socket. And you can get to the name of the socket right there. It's, it's a static variable that's shared out like that. Um, so that socket is the thing that's at the end of the spring arm. <laughs> I have to do that every time I say it now. Um, so that's, that's at the end of the spring arm. And that's the point that we're really interested in. Right. Um, OK, so we'll go there. Now, let's see. Uh, anything else we need? Oh, yes. We did make an orthographic camera. Uh, yes, we do. Also, this, for whatever reason, oh, this has a separate. Has a, does this have a use point? Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has that too. So, also don't want it there. We didn't actually, I never actually tried it without setting that. Um, I didn't test it, but I don't want it to do that. So, I just set it to false right away. You might not need that line, but okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, orthographic. I can imagine where you might have, like, you want the camera to follow you, but the spring arm to stay fixed or something like that, where you might have a different setting for the camera versus the spring arm on the control rotation. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you might. There, there, could be, there could be a case where you'd want to do that, but since this happens not to be one of them. Okay, pretty simple orthographic or perspective. Um, I don't know if... If everyone knows what this is, I'm not, I'm not sure, but so this is perspective. As things get further away, they shrink. Um, this is an orthographic view. So we can zoom out, but you can't tell how close we are to something. There are no angles on it. And you notice when I go to the side here, you don't see the side edge of the, um, if I go to the side here, whoops. You sort of see like the side. You can see, you can see that side edge there because we're looking at it on an angle. Mm -hmm. But with an orthographic, everything is perfectly flat to the, the plane in which we're looking. So that's, that's what we're going to want. Um, I just I don't know if you maybe haven't worked with orthographic before, don't know what that word means. That's what it is. Uh, perfectly flat view of everything, no matter how far away it is. Um, all right, so mm, orthographic. Where are we here? Uh, I think the width and the ratio, just so that we know about the frame of reference we're going to have within the scene. Oh, yes. There it is. Uh, we decided <clears throat> that that would be an adequate width. Um, so it's 1,024 Unreal units. That should be a big enough uh, chunk of game world. Yeah, relative to, to the tank, the it seemed like it was a good amount of space. All right, and then we need the aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. And I believe that a like a 4 by 3 thing, like a classic 1024 by 768, or like an old uh, Pre-HD TV. I guess it's called standard def, but now that term is not standard at all. Uh, old def. So we just went with that. Um, so that'll be 1024 units across and 768 units down. Um, basically aspect ratio times ortho width equals height. Um, and we could have just written 0.75, but uh, we didn't. So <laughs> you can at home though. Um, all right, and same thing with the world rotation. Um, so this isn't going to stack with the spring components world rotation. This is just going to be, we're just basically saying attach to this point and here, start pointing downward. And we're never going to change that orientation. We just always want the camera to point downward. Um, it is relevant to set it on the spring arm, though, because otherwise the spring arm could be coming off the tank like backwards or sideways we or something like that. Pointing down at the ground 500 units behind the tank or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The spring arm would be aligned along the ground, which is not great. Right. Um, all right, so that covers those two. Um, I think we can compile and start uh, working in the editor to test that out, right? Uh, we might be able to. I'm not sure if we need to set our default pawn type, but let's, let's yeah, we'll, find out. We will need to go do that. Mm, okay, okay, there you go. 
file and then we'll create a game mode. We did decide we were just going to do this first game mode as a blueprint, but once mm -hmm. we start doing the game rules of, you know, how many zombies are going to come chase our tank, we'll reparent the game mode to our custom game mode class. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in a little bit. So... Oh, actually, yeah, because we started with the C++ class, we could just create a blueprint based on that tank game. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, we, we already do have one. Uh, if, you, if you started this as a blueprint project, you will have to... Just to quickly go over this, you will have to come up here and create a game mode and then name it whatever, and then it'll appear down here. Uh, code projects give you this automatically. All right, so let's create a blueprint. We'll just put it right up in the top content folder. It's fine. My tanks game mode, and it's fine. Uh, go. And this way we can set a reference to our tank blueprint without having to go hard code any asset references. And we will, yes, and we will open that up. I think it's open just over oh, oops, on the right side it's there. it's over here. It is Running open. away. Back. There we go. All right, so that's what we don't want. We don't want the default pawn. We want our okay. tank class, but specifically the blueprint of the tank class. Yes. There we go. So that. Good. And then. And hey, compile failed. Great default. I prob that's, that's probably a miscapitalization. Because yeah. the oh. one thing that I did, yeah, I see that object is not capitalized. I do see. The one thing that I typed without autocomplete. Oh, and also if you drag the log over just so everybody can see what that oh, message yes. was in case oh, sorry. they run right. into the same thing. That was on the wrong <laughs> screen. Let, let's let's uh, put that down here so that we can. Yeah, so uh, we came up with an error and then we clicked that error in the log and it showed us the problem. Um, all right. That's all fixed. Oh, we should associate the game mode with the level also. Oh, um, oops, that's in here. Uh, oh, um, no, it's not. What am I doing? In the, in the level settings, I think? Yeah. Or we can just do oh, it for the whole project. Yeah, actually. I, I want to do it for the, yeah. I Let's think do it for the whole, for the whole project. So, do, rather than that game mode, we will use our my tank game mode. And we could edit this here, but I really actually prefer to be in the blueprint but if you don't, edit it here. That's fine, too. All right, project settings. So that's automatically saved. Let's recompile that. But it is, it is nice that it's easy to sort of swap back and forth once you're like, oh, I want to use this pawn instead, or yeah. get a super tank and swap that one in to try it out. Yeah, that, that's, that's uh, we have a lot of freedom there. OK, so that's great. And we're clearly using our tank's camera now, and it's not where we want it to be. So let's figure out what's going on. There is our camera. Oh, um, do we? Our camera, are we not on auto possess? Oh, this one that we placed in the level probably isn't. No. Yeah, we um, have, did. We place another camera in the level. Wait, hold on. We can just delete that tank. Yeah. There we go. I'm not playing. I did press delete. Um, what can I delete the tank? Okay. That was odd that the tank didn't want to delete. Okay. Well, that was strange. Um, oh, and I think we normally put a player start point in the map at this point. To, I think there is. Know? There's one already in the level because we started with one of the auto-generated ones. So oh, one we did. I wonder if this level has an override on the game mode, actually. So if you look for the world settings under there... And what mm. over it? Yeah. Oh, I think it's overriding it with none. So it might be over, but there should be a clear option. Yeah. Well, okay. not great. Put in our player start. Isn't that the right type of player start? Hmm. I'm not sure exactly why that's not working. You set my tanks game mode to use, and that has got the. Yeah, so that's fine. Did we compile that blueprint just to check? Uh, which one? The my tanks. Yeah, we should be fine on that. BP. Oh, does this need an auto possess? That might be. I really hope that that was the correct answer. 
But it wasn't. Hmm. All right, let's check this again. Oh, you know what? We made a constructor change, so you've got to close and reopen. Oh, we did. That's right. So. Um, well, if we have to reset the auto-possess, we will. So that is the one thing is hot reload is really helpful for people to make new functions or treat property values, but if you do change something in the constructor, you will need yeah, to um, just compile and reopen. But Oh, did I not press that? Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Then we'll do it the other way. Because we already compiled, so it's just a matter of now reopening it with the editor. Let's see where that opens up. Oh, good. We should probably have set this as a default map, too. Well, I must admit to being a little surprised that that didn't work. All right. Project settings, maps and modes, maps and modes, there we are. Editor startup map should be that one. Um, tank BP is our default pawn class, our default player controller class is whatever. Game state, player state, spectator pawn. Yeah, we didn't set a game instance, we didn't need any of that. Oh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't reset the auto possess in case that was important. This is actual programming, <laughs> by the way. This is what it actually looks like, but you're not usually broadcasting. <laughs> that's, that's a key difference. Not helpful. So, also, well, please don't. What might be good is just to close out the editor, recompile without it being open. Uh, sure. And just start the instance from... Yep. We'll save that. Just to be really sure that we've rebuilt everything, because... Oh, hey, we were on the wrong project. Let's set that to this. Oh, yes, I started a project. That. There we go. So just a quick compile. And then from the rest of the project, we're just um, adding functions to existing classes and not really messing with the constructor, so we should be good. There we go. Did I just want to make sure we attach these to the root component and everything like that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we did. Okay. Everything looks like. Um, I did hit run on that. So, oh, there, there it is. There you go. Oh, this that. one actually less surprising. <laughs> but, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, what you could do is just hit um, play and then, you know, alt tab to get your key back so you can pop out and see what's being yeah, ejected from your. So I hit uh, shift F1 to pop out. And let's see, where are we? Our start is fine. Where is our tank? Uh, that would be interesting if we found out we didn't have a tank. Uh huh. We don't appear to have a tank. Did we not spawn a tank in the world? Make this one auto possess just to see. Yeah, uh -huh. so I made this one auto possess. That's um odd. I thought it would spawn the tank automatically. We clearly have missed something somewhere, but in the name of doing things on this stream, yes. other than saying um a lot and looking <laughs> puzzled, we're going to put a tank in the world, and on our next stream, we'll come back we and we'll figure out what we did wrong, because this works at our desks. Yes. When I used to work at a different company, we had, uh, we had a policy of any engineer saying the phrase, it works at my, on my desk, it works at my desk, it works on my computer. Uh, is an automatic box of donuts that you have to buy and bring in for the rest of the office. So, I'm not going to say that, but... <laughs> but, hey, we now have a tank with our camera. Yes. And, which, actually, you can see the little camera preview now with the tank selected in the world, which is pretty cool. Uh, yes, okay, so uh, we're going to go to project settings. Now, you can set up input uh, directly in C++. You can, you can hard code that. Um, we're not going to do that today. If, if you would like to see an idea of how to do that, though, the default pawn class is a really good one because it not only binds your input, but it also creates the bindings. Uh, and it does so in a careful way so that it doesn't create them twice in the same session, and it, it avoids the pitfalls associated with that. The other way to avoid the pitfalls associated with that is to do it in this menu that we went to the trouble of making for you. So you can just type things in and they all work. Yeah, so by um, setting up these basic inputs and then binding to them, 
in our code classes, we can add multiple inputs like I think we have WASD and then also the arrows, but if we wanted to put a gamepad in, that would all be easy to do and it would all basically map back to the same move X and move Y that we're creating. Yeah, gamepads are super easy. So if you wanted to use the D-pad, it's right here. If you wanted to use the thumbsticks, they're right here. I mean, it's, it's very easy to do. We don't have a gamepad hooked up here, so we're just not going to bother with it right now, but it's really, really simple. So. And the movement that we decided on while Richard is setting up all of our um, key presses for move X and move Y is that um, basically you use W and S to move either upward or downward on the screen, and then A and D to move left and right. Um, but sort of the tank would have a turning radius. It wouldn't just kind of move only on perpendicular axes. So you get some really interesting movements, and that's what we're going to start setting up. Uh, yeah, so you know some of these are scaled negative one. Um, so S is our positive Y direction. W is our, our negative Y direction. Uh, you could make these bigger if you wanted to. Um, bear in mind, though, that if you press, for example, up and W at the same time, you'll double up on that negative one. So you'll actually end up getting uh, possibly a negative two there. We'll go through how you deal with that in a moment. It's not too difficult, but it's something that uh, new people sometimes don't. Or if you you know hold W and S at the same time, you'll get zero and no movement, which is a little bit a little bit clearer. But it, you can still get it for press, pressing two up inputs at the same time. Yeah, yeah. The the negation kind of makes sense because you press you know whatever right and left at the same time, so that's nothing. But yeah, pressing up in two different ways will actually give you double speed if you don't uh, program your game to avoid that. Uh, what do we need? Left and right arrows. I forget if it's left and right or right and left to make the pattern, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's put in the right one. First. Oh, for the values to alternate. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely doesn't matter at all. <laughs> but so many programmers will care and will be bothered by it. All right. So X and Y, pretty much the same kind of deal. Um, do you want to add the mouse now? Um. We can, we can do, come back to it. We can do the aiming when we do the turret. So, okay. Yeah. We're going to do more here later uh, to, to have our mouse aiming, but for right now, we're just going to move. All right, so that's there. That's saved in the config file, basically the instant you type it in. Um, let's save that map. And let's go over to our uh, pawn class, which is still tank. And the way input works, it's kind of like a stack, right? We're saying, okay, for instance, W is forward, so our move... Uh, Y in some axis, and so then we have to say, okay, what does move uh, Y do on the code side? That's, that's, a, that's a good point. Actually, we didn't we didn't do that yet. So yeah. let's um, so we're gonna make these functions private because I like protected actually in case we made a derived tank class that would do something different. But we're not gonna do that right now. If we want to make this protected later, we can. Um, these functions are gonna pre be pretty simple. So you noticed you may have noticed, uh, and if you didn't, I'll put it back up on screen when we did this, that you had input ac actions and input axes. So an axis mapping uh, has a value from 0 to 1, and an action mapping doesn't, but it does have events like I just pressed the button, I just released the button, I have held the button down for a configurable certain length of time. Uh, these are axes. All right, so they pass along the axis value. Yes. So they will have... An axis value. Oh, we call it axis value. Just so uh, we had an X, we had a Y. Now these names happen to be the same as the names that I wrote in the uh, input thing uh, in in the axis when I named them in the program. Um, they don't have to. No, they don't. I, I just did because it was convenient. But they could be you know whatever you want. It could be like run forward, sidestep. Like those those could be names. You it's fine. Um, all right, so let's write those. So void a tank. Uh, we had move x with a float of axis value. Nothing yet. And we need the same thing on the y-axis. OK. So that's good. So now when we're setting up our, our input, we can then take our input component. And this function is already here because really? it was in the template for pawn, right? For the set up mm -hmm. player input component. Yeah, this up to me typing this line is just is just what comes with a pawn uh, standard. Um, wow, it's really not gonna it's not gonna autocomplete any of this. Save over here. Oh well, it autocompleted that. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Is he going to tell me what the arguments are? No, it's not. Okay. Um, I do know what they are, but we're going to look at it. All right, so now this part, I actually tend not to, this is an F name. I tend not to use the text macro here. Feel free if you want to. It's, it's fine either way. But this is the part that does have to match what we put in our input. Yes. This is not the function. This is the name of the input axis that we made up uh, in the editor a moment ago. That has to match. Um, all right, so when we receive uh, data on that, oh, by the way, an axis, every frame you will get an update on an axis, even if it's just zero. An action, if you're not pressing, releasing, or holding the key, you just won't hear anything about it. Right. Um, all right, so an axis will, will call a function. The function will be called on this tank. Uh, that's, that's who's going to you know, receive the information. And the address of the function is, this is x, so x. It's, now this is our function name, unrelated to the input name. They will often be the same, though. I mean, just it's, Out of keeping things straight, right? Yeah, just to keep things straight in your own head as a programmer, the string and the function name and the, you know, just make them all match. It'll, it'll cut down on confusion. Um, OK. So that's good. So now we've, we've received these. Now, a key critical thing that people make uh, mistakes on right here is they'll go right here and they'll go, OK, so um, I guess my velocity gets this value on it or whatever. You know, like <laughs> that last key didn't help you. OK, so they'll do something like this right here. And like I said before, the problem is multiple keys bound to the same thing. Yeah, this is going to get totally up, but all of a sudden you go twice as fast. And... Right. So we just want to know what you pressed. That's, that's all we're really going to store here. We just want to know what, what you pressed, and then later on, uh, later on we'll handle it. We've actually, we're going to do some interesting things with a custom struct to sanitize that data. Yes. OK. So since we know we're going to have moving, aiming, and shooting, it's a bunch of different stuff, we're just going to, and also because we want to show you how to make structs. That's <laughs> also secretly part of our plan. Um, so we're going to have this struct manage all of our inputs, right? Yes. So we're going to handle aim or movement and aiming, and then when we get to firing in a later stream, we will handle that too. And yeah, we did dis do some discussion over, you know, say we had a superpowered tank or a tank with multiple turrets or mm -hmm. things like that, um, how that would be handled. And we decided we at least wanted every tank to be able to move with that same, you know, WASD input with the uh, some sort of turret aiming and then some sort of firing. Yeah. And I mean, even for extreme examples, like if you played um, uh, Guilty Gear X, that was one, or Skullgirls or anything like that, where the characters are all wildly different from each other, but they still all have the same inputs. It's still like, you know, you have the direction stick and the same number of buttons, no matter what character you're playing, no matter what they do with those buttons, it's the same buttons. So that was the kind of thing we said, there's not gonna be a tank that has like, oh, this tank has like three other keys that no other tank has. There's no has. teleporting tank. There's <laughs> no. Yeah, and if there were, it would have to be bound to like one of the regular fire buttons. Right. So yeah, so we're, we're gonna have a standard struct for this. All right, so we got, whoa. All right, extra. Um, generated body because we want this to be recognized by Unreal. Um, and well, we don't really need to say public. We said public when we wrote this, but it's a struct, so I don't think we need to. You want to talk about? Did, I, you mentioned sanitizing a second ago, right? Right. So the, sanit the, the sanitizing the data means that you know if we do hold two different input keys and they're on the same axis, you don't end up with going twice as fast or going backwards twice as fast, you're turning at twice the rate. Um, it's just going to say, uh, based on what you're currently pressing, I'm returning to you how you need to move, um, even no matter how many uh, keys you're pressing at once. And then we'll handle things like the, the double key press. There we go. And um, yeah, we've got the vector for the, the movement input. And we decided to do everything in the 2D axis just because we're going to be in this orthographic view and we're using paper 2D, um, everything is in, we're going to use F vector 2Ds for the movement input. 
Yeah, if we had a more 3D game, we might have used a 3D input with the Z always being zero because you might be doing vector multiplication with it based on what way you're facing, like if it were a spaceship game. If you really wanted to be able to shoot over something and like have some sort of hang time on the, the cannon fire or something like that, then... Yeah, then just for convenience, when we go to multiply vectors together or whatever, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to convert it to a vector 3D, but we found that we never needed to, so it was fine. And so that the void sanitize function that um, we're putting in here is not, none of these are U functions because um, they can't be within they a U function. They can't be. Right. So um, we're going, that's why we have this, the move Y and move X on our tank, and then the secondary like within the struct, uh, move X and move Y. Yeah, that's a good thing to point out. Um, so when we were back over here, and we said we're going to bind this to the tank. Why don't we just bind it to this and then like our tank input or whatever, right? Like, like to NAC. Why don't we just do that and, and, just, and just have it be on the tank input? And the reason is that this would not have been a function, or I'm sorry, that, that, this, that this would not have been a U object because U structs are not U objects. So you can't do that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to have these little functions here are just going to give the thing directly to the input right. and do no further processing. Uh, and also need to So we have um, the raw movement input, which is what's going to be taken from the um, the tanks move X and move Y functions. And that's going to be the input basically to our struct. And then we're going to hand back the um, U property movement input of you know, how we cleaned it up and handing it back to the tank to move around. That's right. So, so the, neat, the neat thing about this is that that means that all of our cleaning up of our input uh, can happen here in our sanitize function. And uh, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to worry about like, oh, what if we, what if we wanted to cap it? What if we wanted our input to, to be a square? What if we want our input to be a unit radius? What if we wanted to be able to go faster forward than backward? Like if it's a person who, you know, can't sprint backward full speed, this could handle all of that. And then anyone else that wants to that wants to get it from us can get a nice cleaned up, game ready, usable piece of data. Uh, and that way we separate out the work, and that cuts down on bugs and makes the code cleaner and easier to read by other engineers. It's it's overall a really helpful way to do things. Should I actually create one of these? Okay. Okay. So this struct is called F Tank Input. Do I have an unlock on? Yes, I do. All right, so uh, I guess you can't see where I am because you don't know what I just pressed, but so let's, so we're in our tank. And do we make this, oops, this is, is this protected or is it? I think we can, I think we made it um, protected in case we wanted to have any slightly move, movement changes on children tanks. That's right. Blueprints. That's right. We, yes, we do need that. So. This, unlike these which are private, this will make protected, will make it blueprint visible. Uh, I can put, I guess. Yep. And having things be visible anywhere, um, even if you're not sure if you're going to use them later on, is helpful just because that way you can check on the values provided, you can um, just verify them, and if you turn out you need to make, add access, write access later, you can do that pretty easily. We don't actually need to allow private access because it's not private. Okay, so we're, okay we're just going to call it tank input. Um, it's pretty simple. All right, coming back here. Um, now it's a struct, not a pointer. So it's not this. It's uh, We're so literally looking to be accessing the struct, so we need to um, yeah, use that instead. So pretty much. Really? <laughs> okay. Uh, there. And this one too. All right, so that's pretty good. Um, we actually need to do stuff with it though. Yeah, we need to now write what the sanitize function is that. And, um, well, and the move X. I don't think, think we just declared those functions, right? We didn't actually write them, did we? Right. We just. Yeah, we didn't write those yet. Okay, um, up top or down at the bottom, what do you, what do you um, think? We can put it at the top because the turret class is also, or the, the turret struct is also at the top of our function. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. So we'll bump the tank down in its own uh, file. 
in order to put the input up here. So we needed move x and y. These are basically the same the same function when you get down to it, but yeah, just operating on one axis or the other. So, like I said, we're not going to do anything really fancy right at the time we get the input. We're just going to record everything, just write it all down, and then later go deal with it. Yeah, if you happen to somehow, you know, press all arrow keys at once, keep track and then handle that for, um, with the sanitize function. So that was pretty simple. All right, now let's clean it up, though. Is that, is that our raw movement input? Um, it sure would be. If I had typed it correctly or had autocomplete. <laughs> Thank you for noticing that. Um, every time. I type Santa eyes every time. You just want there to be like a Santa function that comes out and... I do. I want my tank to have like a big white beard and just be a red tank and shoot presents and, and or coal, <laughs> depending on what kind of zombie you've got. We'll do that for a mod on stream 17. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I mean, I don't... If, if this goes to December... Um, all right, so our movement input. Um, all right, so that's going to equal our raw movement input. Uh, and vectors have this convenient function, clamp axes. So basically, I just want to, this, this does exactly what it looks like, but I'll explain it anyway. Um, just take each individual axis, in this case, just x and y, and make sure that they're in the range of negative 1 to positive 1, and if not, bring them in. And so that's the one that will handle if you manage to press to the same direction at one, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we made, yeah. So now we've made sure that none of your values are ridiculous or something that you shouldn't have been able to input. So that's that's step one. And a lot of games you could just stop right there. Now the thing that'll be a little bit strange is if you have a game with a thumbstick um, and you go for the diagonal, that'll be about 0.7x and 0.7y because of trigonometry. Um, it, it, it won't map to a square, though. You can never get 1x and 1y at the same time. That's, that's outside of the unit circle. So in that case, you would still, you would still have to clamp it uh, by a process that's called normalization, which you also don't have to program. So that's that. So that basically will take, uh, will take the square shape of our input and map smoosh it, it down to, to a circle. Yeah, yeah it'll, it'll, it'll make it... It'll cleanly pull the lines back so that now your, your unit vector is one unit long. I hope that that makes sense. I guess it's so that you'd move the same speed whether you're moving diagonally versus moving straight up or down. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. basically that's it. If you've played older games like, uh, like Quake, you might remember that running diagonally gave you about a 50% speed boost. It was pretty crazy. So, of course, that's the only way to play. Um, you don't want to do that. And this... We need to clear this. Just remember that next frame, we're just going to be doing this again. Without and that, we just keep going faster and faster. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd, ha you'd have to press the down key to, to pull it back down, uh, or else you would, just, you would just go indefinitely, which is not fun. Um, all right. So that's pretty much it. But you can see how like this is all, this is a good thing to do. Uh, I think it's, um, the sanitizer being underlined, because I don't know if you had a void in the struct. Oh, didn't I? Um, Let's just double check before we save and compile. Man, you are on it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Now, uh, there's an obvious issue here, which is that these functions are awesome, except that one of them never gets called. I don't think we ever call sanitize, did we? Because um, it should be in tick. Oh, nope, we didn't start. Um, but that's because we haven't really worked on the movement, which is going to be in tick yet. So that's true. We're not even doing anything with it, but but we are at least reading it. Yes. Um, I guess you know at this point, I don't know if we're if we're maybe. You want to go ahead and compile, make sure there were no other typos that we didn't spot in there, and then yeah, like I, you want to log is, things out. Yeah, this is the point where, um, as a programmer, I would go, okay, I've just been programming for you know like fifteen minutes or whatever. Should probably see that this didn't all just completely break. I'm going to use log temp and warning. Log temp because I don't care, and it's very easy to search all files and find any of those that you left in, uh, so you don't submit those to you know to your database or whatever. And warning because it comes out in bright yellow, but it doesn't stop the game, so it's really easy to spot in the log. There won't be anything else in the log, but it's just a good practice for debug info that you really want to see. 
Yeah, and while we were prepping this, there was a lot of logging going on and trying to make sure that we had all of our input going the way we expected and things like that. So This, by the way, works just like uh, printf for those familiar. So those values are tank input, was it? Yes, that's what we did. Well, it wasn't f tank input. Tank input. Uh, dot. I think we just want to get the movement input, which should be public. Yes, we do. Dot movement input x. Tank input dot movement input dot y. Okay. And that way we can yeah, check our work basically. Oh, right. And of course, uh, before we use it, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I promise, uh, if we are still doing the stream in December, or, you know, whatever other C++ stream, it'll be the Santa motion. Yeah, we're going to be shooting presents and things, that's fine. <laughs> All right, uh, tank input.sanitize, that should work. All right, so now we should be able to get back to this. Our tank isn't going to do anything. We'll be, able, we'll be able to check the logs. Once we file in. Now there's always the question of whether or not it will compile, because, you know, the slightest typo. As you can see, I make a ton of them because I don't always program with Lauren. Uh, compile complete, yay! Oh, but it did work. Yes. Well, because like, I had you this time. <laughs> so. All right, so now we play. That's open. Uh, as you can see, we're spamming that log. It's it's just one per frame. So there we go. There's there's the down arrow. Here's the up arrow. Right arrow. Left arrow. And A. And right arrow at the same ooh, a and right arrow at the same time does that. And still just negative one, not negative two. A and left arrow will do that, which is zero. I hope that's readable. That's probably not readable. Anyway, trust me, the values are right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's probably too small to be readable. Oh, we should have done an on-screen debug. I can zoom. Oh, okay. All right, we'll do that. Okay, so we're playing the game. <laughs> yeah, Shelley, thank Up you. arrow, <laughs> down arrow, <laughs> left, right. A, which is also left, plus left, because we capped it, plus right, does that, and hitting up does that. Now that doesn't look normalized to me. That's actually interesting. Shouldn't that have been normalized? Let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That just returned the safe normal, and we probably should have done this. Oh, and that equal to? Yep, that. Making the case for debugging. All right. So the diagonal didn't work there. Oh, compile complete. So now we can. All right. Uh, Shelly, could you give us one of those zooms again? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now the diagonal. There we ah, go. Ah, there we go. That's what it should be. Roughly 0. 0.7. That's the sine or cosine of 45 degrees for those of you who are familiar with the trig. But yeah, that's, that's the amount that you should be moving diagonally. OK. So I think now it's time to add to our tick function and get the tank moving. Yeah? Yes. And also, let's get rid of this. All right. <laughs> no, let's not get rid of things we need. <laughs> get rid of things we didn't need. All right. Um, yes, so we want our tank to move. So that's, that's going to be in our tick function. We're going to sanitize the input first so that it's, uh, it's sensible and we can get good data out of it. Um, so that's still staying. Then. Oh, I think I might have jumped ahead. I did jump ahead. You did. I thought you had a plan. <laughs> so we're going to make our custom function library because we know that that's Oh, whoops. Is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yes. We're not doing that yet. Okay. Um, our static blueprint library? Yes. I, I love these things. I put these in every project. Um, There's actually, you know, a couple in the engine, like the um, gameplay statics, which we use a yep. lot. We use gameplay statics all the time. And that just means that the functions will be available in any blueprint that we make. That's what we want, a blueprint function library. So this is, um, it's basically just going to be a big class that's full of static functions that we can use, and they're generally very helpful. Stuff like, you know, uh, getting information about the current game mode. Um, I think in ours we do some... Apparently I hit caps lock at some point. Uh, things like, we know that we're going to have some specialized 2D math that we're going to want for our tank, so let's go ahead and put it there so that both the tank or the turret could access it, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, I was doing a project where you could change from one level to another. So there, would be, there was a function where you could say, okay, store my, my score so that when I go to the next level, 
I can get my score and put it on my new pawn. Like that, that kind of thing. And there was a reason why we weren't doing it on the player controller. I forget what that was at, at, at this moment. But there was a reason for it. And we needed, we needed to have it done that way. Um, okay, uh, we are in here now, which we're, is flashing our taskbar that you can't see. And we are making a custom luxury library. Okay, so this, uh, this is our CVP file. So here we go. We pretty much are just going to add, and you notice this is a U object. This doesn't go in any level. It's not an actor. Um, all right, what functions did we want for today? I know we had something with, uh, with angles. Yeah, I think it's to... Add a little convenience function. And all the... Oops, Oops, that's, I'll write it down. That's not it. The delta, oh yeah, the degree. Uh, yes. I don't want to read it. So that was part of it is when we were coming in, there are already some functions to get your delta angle when you're working with 3D vectors, but because we were really trying to keep all of our movement in 2D, we ended up writing a couple of convenience spec, um, functions yes. to do that for us. Also, they currently are in radians and we want it in degrees. Um, I have already submitted code to change that in the future, but that hasn't been released yet. Uh, so that, that'll be out there. But find delta angles, the good function, but it works in radians. I guess it's scheduled for 412, or it might be in a 411. It's probably 412. I don't think they would change that. I think we did it lot. last week, so. Yeah. yeah. So for now, we're just writing that function in here. And if you guys want to use it in your project today, obviously you can copy the code and use it in your projects. Yeah, this is pretty general purpose. So angle one, angle two. Oh, didn't want you to do that. Um, all right, back over to here. Oh, we call this U tank statics, I think. All right. Uh, oh, we have. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll do the second one next. Um, all right, we're gonna type it out. And really, this is pretty much identical to the fine delta angle that's already in the engine. It just is comparing to degrees rather than uh, radians for some of the um, adjusting of the angles. Yeah, so we don't want answers that are greater than 180 degrees, and we don't want answers that are less than negative 180 degrees. Um, and this, this could honestly be a while, but that's okay. I mean, if you gave us angles that were, you know, a huge angle like 720 minus oh, 90. Keep iterating back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be a while. The engine already does have unwind functions, though, to, you know, to, to get that back into the initial range. And so I think this function assumes that. Uh, the cost to not doing that would be just an extra check every time you do this. So that's pretty simple. Again, for those of you who want this to be a little more robust, do that. Okay, basically putting the find delta angle degrees in this function library means that yeah, our tank or our turret can find the delta angle between, say, their direction and where they want to go without having to have this function duplicated if we did want to change it to the while version or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty predictable what we do on the other side. Is that pretty much the opposite thing? And then return that. And then that's it. Okay, and now we know that it's between negative 180 and positive 180, assuming you didn't have crazy wound up angles uh, to begin with. All right. Um, and then, so we're actually, we know we talk about include what you use a lot throughout the tutorials or the live streams, but because this is meant to be this utility class, we can actually include it into our whole project um, header file so that automatically all of our classes will know about it. That is tanks.h, not tank, tanks. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't want to include this everywhere, and it's not that big. It's not going to change that often, so it's fine. Um, this is also a small project. Inefficiency like that doesn't really hurt you too much when you're in a small project. It hurts you when you're making a giant project. Uh, it's still a good practice, but... 
Sometimes saving time and saving annoyance is worth it. All right, and then we need another function. So we have two uh, 2D points, and we want to know what the angle is that would make one of them uh, from one point. Where would you have to aim to be pointing at the other one? And again, there's already one of these for 3D, but for our particular 2D case, especially looking down on um, in an orthographic way, uh, what the math would need to be to always be finding the angle to go look at something in a 2D plane. Yeah. Yeah, again, we, we just didn't feel like converting that to a 3D vector just for this one function. Um, so we did this. Uh, now this keyword uh, thing here, this is for when you start typing in in the search window, it'll it'll pop up. Um, like for example, the, well, I can't show you because you can't see what I'm typing, but the, the string append function, if you start to type concatenate, which is a, a normal, which is normally, uh, where the name for strings adding together comes from okay. uh, in like regular C++, um, it will find the append function even though concat, like those letters, don't match up at all. Or branch and if I think is another one that people use a lot. You know. Yep, typing just... if we get you the branch node is really, it's really helpful stuff. It just sort of works when it feels like it shouldn't have. Um, so it's very convenient. All right, so this is just gonna be a bool. Yep. By the way, the reason this is a bool, uh, instead of just giving you an angle, which isn't usually represented by a boolean, is uh, if you give me two points that are directly on top of each other, there's really, there's no right answer, or every possible answer is right. There's, there's not a good answer to that, so, um, so you get a false. You get a, like, that was a degener degenerate question. Fine, look at angle. So you basically couldn't find the angle, or would have taken too long to just sit there and iterate and give you too many answers. Well... It's, yeah, it's the same point, so if, like, what's the angle from this thing to this other All thing? It's, it's <laughs> coincident. Yeah, it's any angle, so any angle I tell you could cause you to aim your tank turret on an arbitrary direction for just no reason. So we just tell you, nah, it doesn't, there is none. Uh, so we have a, a starting point, we have a target point, and, uh, and that, those names kind of help us to... Uh, not to not to mix them up. A1 and A2 are not that bad if you mix them up, um, but start and target are pretty, yeah. yeah. They'll be noticeable. Um, okay, so as a blueprint function, these, uh, I think we've said this before, but these const f vector inputs, mm -hmm. so they're references, which would normally mean that they're outputs like this, but they're constant, which means that you can't write to them, and when blueprint functions are made, it knows that it's constant, it knows that you can't write to it, so it makes it an input. Um, and we made these references because we don't want to copy the vector struct. There's no reason to create a new empty f vector and then copy into it. We can just use the old one. We know we're not going to change it, so um, it's fine. There's okay. no, no reason. Or it just also needs to be a, a 2D. Um, it does need to be a 2D. See, I could just, I benefit from being able to look from way back here. Yeah. <laughs> I benefit from you being able to look from way back there. <laughs> Um, all right, so this is a U-tank statics function, and it's called that. All right, um, let's see, where did we write this? Oh, we wrote this down here. I think it might actually be at the very bottom. Further down? Like, you mean way down? Oh, yay, question. There, there will be some questions. It's, oh, here it is. It's, it's sort of wedged across screens. Okay. I mean, we've written this once, but we just don't want to write it. Uh, yes, we, we've already done it live today. We've, <laughs> we've done that once. Um, all right. So, so we're going to get a 2D normal, uh, which again is the unit circle. And whenever you're doing this vector math, just, just remember it's always end minus start. Um, and, and I sometimes forget this, and what I'll end up doing is I'll just go, okay, it's just one dimensional. If I'm at five and I'm going to two, the direction is negative three. So it's two minus five. Like I'll sit there and put my, I don't know if you've seen me doing this <laughs> no, with my monitor you, but I'm going to watch this, <laughs> but I'll put my fingers on my desk and make an imaginary ruler and measure things and point. I, this probably tells you something about my learning style. I don't I'm, know. Would I like to start the installation of Visual Studio 2013, 2015? I think since we've got it installed, we're good. <laughs> I will prob I would probably not. That's 
Oh, it's a pop-up on the other monitor. Right? Yeah, that was yeah. from yeah from last stream, where we where we played with that. Um, or was that two streams? That was two streams ago. All right, so uh, okay, so we've got that, and that's going to be a vector two D, and we're going to want this to be normalized. We do actually already have this with the equal, so we won't have the mm -hmm. minor yeah. bug we had before. <laughs> we're, we're just initializing it to right there, yes, and we won't won't do that again. Um, now, if that normal that we get is zero or is nearly zero, good enough. If that's the case, uh, then basically that means that the two points were right on top of each other, and it doesn't really make sense to ask for the angle between them, like, like I said five times a minute ago, so I won't say it again. Um, but, I'm sorry, if it's, if it's not, yeah, if it is zero, let me f finish that train of thought. If it is zero, then there's no good answer to that question, so there you go. If it's not zero, then... Okay, we're, we're going to give you something back. All right. Now we're going to use a straight uh, trig function here, so that, that is going to that is going to work in radians. Um, everything that we're doing is working in degrees, so we'll just have to convert it. Um, that's fine. Yeah, if you're doing things with rotation or, or trigonometry and you're getting either really small values when you expect large ones, like I think we were like trying to rotate all the way around and only getting a little bit of um, yep. movement on the tank, and we're like, what could it be? It is probably was the conversion. Yep. One of the first good things to check. Yep. So in this one, you can take your your uh, distances, and you actually wouldn't need to normalize this too much. We actually could probably get away with not normalizing this because it's just going to take our delta y versus our delta x. So actually, we could probably take get safe normal out of there, and it would still be okay. But we didn't. So a tan two is your very good friend. Uh, if you're doing a lot of angle finding, take the difference in y, comma, the difference in x, and this will tell you the angle uh, that that corresponds to. Um, it will be in radians, so we just convert it back to degrees. And there you go. And we've already set our output variable. Now, you notice in the, if, if we fail this, we don't set angle at all. So it's just whatever was already in the variable. Um, that's fine. It's the responsibility of the caller to recognize that we gave you a false back, so don't use this don't use the information or just understand that it's just whatever it was before. We didn't touch it. Um, and you'll see an example of this later on when we write this to call the... Yeah, I mean, don't assume that we didn't change it, but just understand that it, it, that's junk now. Yeah. Um, all right, so we've got that. They're saying their start vector needs to be... Oh, right there too, name. yeah. Ah, fuck, because I cut and paste that before Lauren caught it. Who was saying that? Um, the awesome awesome. Twitch stream watchers. Yeah. Thanks, yes, Twitch stream watchers. <laughs> it sure does. Okay, um, where are we now? And so we did that, we I think did that. now we get to move our tank. Yes. Now, now can. I can go ahead and jump ahead. Now we. Can I was just super the... excited to be able to drive the tank around. I know it is pretty exciting to drive a tank. Even so, though you're going to be the one to drive the tank right now. You could drive the tank. I could just. <laughs> that would be fine. Um, can we go back up for that? I think we do. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This part. Okay, so this is this is kind of the fun part of programming. This. I think a little bit. Oh, and the reference because we're gonna do like our speeds and things, make our tank super fast. I just didn't. Just, just gonna because check. they pointed that out and it was <laughs> it was in fact wrong. Let's find anything else that might have slipped through. Uh, Go get some swords and office chairs, and anybody who gets that reference gets internet points from me. That's compiling. I actually don't, so I, <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to earn more internet points. I was not here for that one. Um, all right, we'll let that go. If, okay. it, uh, if we come back and we see that it has failed, we'll, we'll know. Um, okay, so we've sanitized our tank, but we can now actually move the tank. Whew. Yay! I'm all excited right. for this part. Um, and I'm going to put this in a scope here just because this could be, we could move this out to another function if we wanted to. Um, or the, if, if we had multiple tank classes, this would probably be where we would have a virtual function call that would, you know, be move tank in it. And it would, you know, subclasses would override this. It just keeps it a little bit clearer when you're trying to read it. So. Yeah, and it's helpful too because then variables that we declare, like this. So variables that we declare in here will only exist in the scope. So if we accidentally use it outside the scope for something, we'll know. We would have to clean it up for when we move function or something like that. Yeah, we'll know that we did something questionable. All right. 
Oh, good. Now it knows. Yay. All right. Clean that movement input. I clearly misclick that. All right. So. And this, I think, is one of the few places where we do convert the 2D vector to a 3D vector just because there's already a convenience function that we wanted to use really fast. Yep. And that is the is nearly zero. Um, Although I think that does exist for 2D, but we did it anyway. I mean, we could have checked that first and then done this. Like, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter that much. Again, this is the sort of thing if you swept if you swept through this code, you would probably check the tank movement before converting it to a vector 3D. Uh, because why not? It's just, it's just one less access to check. Okay. It will never matter, but it's nicer. Okay. So basically, I said before we're gonna have a turning radius. We're not going to just move only on perpendicular lines. And so mm -hmm. that's what's going to take the movement direction we want to move into, so this desired movement direction, compared to the direction we're already facing. And that's why we've got that fine delta angle function. We need to get that ready before we start actually moving ourselves around. Yes. Um, and because we have limited turning speed, because we don't turn instantly, when you do that, you, you, you didn't just say that, right? You said something that was slightly different. <laughs> slightly different, yes. Okay. <laughs> just making sure. I thought, I thought I wasn't being redundant there. All right. So... Let's figure out what angle we want to move on. F rotator angle. So that's another convenient little function there uh, that will just um, that will just get us our rotation vectors right out of that. We already know that that's normalized. We would normally have normalized desired movement direction, but we already know because tank uh, tank input dot movement input has already been sanitized. So we're not we're not doing that again. Um, all right. So we've got that. And all of our tank movement, because of how we've oriented the level and the tank and everything, is going to be change in yaw. So that's why we're going to work with this delta yaw for moving our tank around. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, where are we? Delta yaw equals okay. All right. And so that new fine, fine delta angle. Oh. <laughs> okay. The yeah, in degrees it's, that we just wrote. Yes. That one that we just did. Um, uh, in degrees, not oh, sorry, in two. Delta angle. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was the other one we just wrote. Yeah. Right. So many okay. functions. So, um, well, two of them, which is enough for me to get the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, we're going to take the current direction the tank is, uh, is facing. Yeah, I think it's component rotation. Is that right? Yes. Not world. No, it's component. Right. Okay. So, we're going to get the way that we're currently facing and the way that we want to face. And you know the difference between them. Yeah, and and by that I mean the yaw of it. And because we have that tank direction, I mean if we just had the direction and not this, or we just had the sprite and not also the tank direction arrow, we would probably use that here so that it still is facing the right way. But having the direction arrow that we can turn on for debug makes it really nice that we can just use that here. Yes, I mean that, that could have just been a scene component, but yeah. oh, pretty I, cool. There's a plural on your delta angles. Which Visual Studio actually caught yeah. for you, so that was... Thank you, Visual Studio. <laughs> All right, so that's there. Um, now, our tank, since the, you know, a tank turret swivels around 360, um, and unlike, you know, a human, the tank is going gonna, is gonna to move the same speed forward and backward. So we don't care if we move backward or not. There's, there's no advantage to moving forward rather than just moving in reverse right. in this particular instance. So I want to know if it's a good idea to move in reverse. We're going to assume it's not just as a default, and then see if it is. So if we're turning at all. Now, we often won't be turning because we're not using an analog stick. We're using uh, you know, these arrow keys, so we only move on eight directions. So it's very likely that for long periods of time, you're just going to move either, a straight line over all the zombies in your way. Yep, we're either not moving or we're moving, but it's in a perfectly straight line. All right, so. If we're, if we're actually going to turn, we want to be facing a different way from what we are. And note that this, that this won't happen. Even if we're facing a different degree than where we want to face, it'll only happen if we're trying to move. 
because the tank cannot turn in place. The tank has to be moving to turn, just like a car or whatever. You know, you can't just just rotate your car, <laughs> right? You have to. You actually have to drive. Um, all right, so there you go. Pretty simple. We're, we're going to start there and then see if we need to adjust it. All right, so the rule is this. If, you, if you're within 90 degrees, just head into it and go. If you're more than 90 degrees, back into it, because that'll be the shorter of the two turns. Right, so basically you're only ever, the sort of paths, if you were to map it out with like, I don't know, a train set on the ground or something is like straightaways, and then 90 degree angles connecting them, and then more straightaway kind of things, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 you'll have that loop instead of turning on a dime. Yeah. Uh, based on your tank's turn speed and movement speed. All right, so, whoops. So if adjusted delta yaw is, this is the low one. Yeah, we're checking the low one first. It's lower than 90. Then we just sort of swing it around to the other way. So we say. Oh, I know why the autocomplete is giving you two things. Because your float. Uh, also because my variable is wrong. Yeah, just that first one. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's true, but also that implies, there we go, that we're moving backwards. And then, of course, you know, same thing on the other side. Still going to move backwards, but the other way. Okay, so either way, as, as long as we're not as long as we're not between ninety left and ninety right, any of we those are going to be forward. Yeah. Anything else is going to be backward, and we're going to pick the the closer side. Um, okay. All right, then. And yeah, the next math is to sort of make sure that per frame we're not doing the whole turn really quickly or same speed of turn or a small turn versus a big turn. Yep. All right, so the question is going to be how much can we, how much can we turn in this one frame? Yell speed's already defined, right? I don't think we created it yet. Did we? We may not have. One of those, as you're like, oh, this should be a variable, so we can tweak it. Not hard code, like, oh, let's make it go 30, oh, yes. <laughs> 30 times delta seconds. Well, it should be. Uh, we should make this um, probably, yeah, edit anywhere in Blueprint, read, write, so that when we want to make our tank go faster, we can just, on the Blueprint, file it up. Yep, definitely should do that. And then we can do it in-game as well, which is nice. Yeah, with uh, simulate, that's always. Just playing around with it. Um, okay, so... I think we can make this read only if you have like power ups or something or boost. Yeah. Yeah, you might do it, but you might do it another way too. You might have the boost so that you don't permanently change the number. There, there could be, I don't know, if you had a permanent like level up and you up the number, then that might be a reason. But I don't know. We'll, we'll do it like this for now. And this is going to be float yaw speed. I think I called it. Yes, yaw speed, and I think. We're also going to have like some acceleration variables and things like that too. Should we go ahead and make those while we're? Um, we can. Mm -hmm. I was I was thinking about just as we get coming back and doing them later, but we, we could do them now. We prefer to do them now. We can just do them as we get to them, like we do with the off speed. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So there we go, and it's commented so that it's it's. When we come back in a couple weeks to do the scene, we go, oh yeah, that variable. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. So, yaw speed times delta seconds. I think it should be called delta seconds. Yes, which is already just nope. It's delta oh. time. I think we usually call it delta seconds, but today we didn't, so whatever. <laughs> All right, so that's the biggest term we can make this frame. If our term, if our turn's absolute value, if its magnitude is smaller than that, then we know we can snap right to it right now and be done. If not, then we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to work with it. So let's see if that's the case. Next, uh, yes, there we go. Thank you. All right, so if that is greater than or equal to the absolute, because remember, some of these rotations will be negative, right. in which case any rotation speed at all will be greater than that. 
Oh, and over here. Wow, that's not how you do that at all. You put parentheses around things. All right. Oh, so we can never have a negative yep. uh, yaw speed. That's yeah, as soon as I said negative yaw speed, I thought, wow, that shouldn't be legal. <laughs> um, yeah, so in order to stop... Um, Sorry, just thinking on last year, we are like, this is totally legal. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is totally legal, everybody. <laughs> in at least three or four states. <laughs> um, all right, so... Clampman 1.0, like one degree per second is ridiculously slow. Uh, I don't think we want any tanks with no turning. If we did, it would be that. Oh yeah, that's true. You know what? Maybe a tank can be just a an in place turret that never turns. That's fine. I'll leave, I'll leave it at zero. I, I'm only I'm really only concerned about avoiding the math error of you try to turn and you have a negative thing and it doesn't make sense. Okay, so um, what was it? Adjusted delta yaw, I believe. Yes. Oh, good thing we remember. Um, yes, so adjusted delta yaw. So we'll only, yeah, well, this is when we're going to go ahead and lock into place. Important to know whether it's reversing. All right, so yeah, this is saying the amount we can turn is greater than the amount we want to turn, so we're good. Um, oh, yeah. All right, so let's figure out what our final angle is going to be. All right, and if you don't check the reverse in this particular case, you're going to end up moving for a little bit and then flipping around and then heading in that direction. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we have the movement angle that we calculated before. Since we know we can reach it, no calculation necessary, just just store it and we're good. Um, and what we're storing is gonna be, what was it, our desired yaw, is that what we called it? Uh, our movement angle. Uh, oh, right. Wait, was that it? Oh, we're oh, just going to add, yeah. change the 180, yeah. Right, so we're going to do that. Um, okay. And that will be unwound, by the way. That's one reason we didn't need the unwind code. If you turn around and around and around, uh, the engine will fix that for you and tap it to the range of negative 180 to positive 180. So it doesn't matter if you're 179 and I add 180 to it, the engine will, will figure it out. So this is if you like are going straight and then back directly up, it doesn't, it won't flip the tank around um, magically. So we use get component rotation to get this, but we use set world rotation, set it. So again, this is world rotation as in it's not relative to the component above it in the hierarchy or anything like that. Absolute relative to the world. This is your this is your rotation. That's what we're trying to do here, um, and that's going to be facing angle. All right, so there we go. We're facing the angle we want. We're done. That was the easy case. And actually, it's even easier when we're not reversing. And if we're not reversing, because then you're facing the same direction that, as our movement. Okay, I'm going to copy this line, then I'm going to change. All right, so we don't we don't need to, to do any of that uh, temp variable stuff. Um, yeah, we probably could actually have just modified movement angle in there, but then if we referred to it later in the function, that would be mystery bugs. So we didn't. Yeah, it's kind of just like, why alter it when you can just make a little temp one to placeholder for this one last case? Okay, so now we know that the magnitude of turn that we want is greater than what we can afford this frame. That's where we are right down here with this else. All right, so we can only rotate uh, maximum yaw speed, or maximum yaw this frame, was it? Yeah, max yaw this frame. That's as far as we can go, and it's not enough. Um, okay. Just gonna keep doing that little increments until we get close enough. And now here we are gonna add local rotation. It doesn't matter. I mean, we could we could take the the world rotation, add to that, and then set the world rotation again. That would be fine. Yeah. But it's all the same, so there's already a function to do it in one step. So we'll just do that. Okay. So the amount we're gonna add is gonna be the max amount, which is nice, right? This this saved us from doing any kind of calculation because we know it's not far enough. So just go as much as we can. That's that's good. Um. 
All right, and of course that's the yaw. So okay, we're going to build the rotator, right, out of the... Yep. Yeah, basically zero. The yaw will be our adjusted, or our max yaw this frame, and then that, that's the only part of the rotator that we're going to build. Yeah, pitch yaw roll, so we only care about uh, the yaw. Okay, so we're doing that. Now the problem is that that's always in the positive direction, um, so that's no good. Um, so what we're going to need to do is... I think we get the sine of the adjusted delta yaw and then multiply that by the... Yeah, I'm trying to see, yeah. Yeah, just put that right in there. Because yeah, max yaw this frame because it takes our speed, which can't be below zero when our delta seconds, which also can't be below zero. Mm -hmm. So we've got to adjust it to be negative when we're trying to rotate in the negative direction. Yeah, so sine will give you positive one, negative one, or zero um, based on the based on the, um, well, the sign of the variable that you give it. So if you give it any positive number, you get one. If you give it any negative number, you get zero, or you get negative one. And if you give it zero, you get zero back. Um, so that's pretty convenient. Like, it's basically, is this positive or negative, and I can just multiply it in. Uh, really helpful. Of, uh, what is it, movement angle dot yaw, or, no, it's adjusted delta yaw. So if we wanted to turn a negative amount of degrees, that'll be negative one. And it'll multiply this by negative one. Okay, and we've already factored in for time. That's all handled. So there you go. That's that's actually also a pretty simple one. And then finally, basically, we've been setting up the all the rotation, which is almost the trickier part because it involves the turning and the backing up. And then setting up the actual movement is pretty straightforward based on the sanitized um, position. Mm -hmm. um, we also rotated first, uh, just because. It, it felt like it would be easier to, to it would feel like it, it would feel slightly more responsive to the player if their rotation is taken into account on the very first frame they press rotation instead of one frame of moving forward and then it starts turning. Yeah, basically, go ahead and rotate the tank treads and then take that direction as where we're heading. Yeah, and, and also it's similar to how your, your car works, right? You turn the wheel in place, the, the tires do turn, and then you start driving. You don't have to go forward a little bit and then do it. Um, later on, when we add collision and the tank's rotation shape matters, this might, this might change, but for now, it's pretty good. All right, uh, this is a vector. So we're going to get our, whoops, right on. We need, we need the direction first. All right, now that we've already rotated the tank, we know what direction we're facing, and tank direction is currently, whoops, is currently, um, Already all, correct, right? All, yeah, it's already good. So we get the forward uh, vector out of that rotation. And then the only thing we need to know is, are we going backward? So you can see, like, whether or not we're going backward, we needed to know first. What our final desired rotation is, helpful to know first. So if we're going in reverse, then take that whole vector and, and uh, negate it. Make it go backwards. If not, okay, keep it as it is. Yeah. That's, that's pretty convenient. I like that you can just, you can just do that. Uh, so all in one line. So now we have the direction. Um, now we want to know our current position. We could get the position of tank direction, but it, it really doesn't matter. We can just, the whole actor, the tank, the tank doesn't move out of its bounding box at any point. If we had a special collision volume, like a collision component for the tank, which eventually we will, this, that's what we would get here. But since the tank doesn't have a collision volume yet, there's no real need to do that. Um, we just use the actor location, which is, which is the root component. It's fine. All right, so now where do we want to go? Well, we want to take our movement direction. And, oh, did we hard code the tank speed right there? I think we did. Well, we're not going to do that this time. <laughs> okay, so mm, that can be confused with yaw speed. Let's call it move speed. Okay. And there we go. And of course, nobody knows what this is. Yeah, that's why I thought tank speed next to yaw speed would be like a little ambiguous. It, they're both technically tank speeds. Now, currently, we don't have acceleration. We're just going to assume that the tank instantly goes to top speed. Um, we could put acceleration in if we wanted to. Maybe we'll do that later. All right. 
um, Unreal units. I mean, I realize units per second does not help a whole lot, but we're using Unreal units. The world's in units. Um, all right. So there we go. Check my scenery for a second if we wanted to go look up the like, actual tank speed and. Yeah, I was just the the Tom Clancy part of my brain was thinking about <laughs> <laughs> about that. Um, Next stream, we'll come feel like it'll be scaled down for a tiny paper tank. Uh, one time we had a slow mo sniper bullet. We actually went because. Seriously, there are some gun nuts working on Tom Clancy titles. Uh, we actually went and we saw how many times the bullet would roll due to the barrel rifling per second. And in the slow-mo, we, we adjusted its roll rate to match. Like, I'm sure nobody ever knew that, but in, uh, in that particular game, yep, <laughs> <laughs> correct number of, uh, of rolls. All right, so um, where are we here? I think we're ready to set the actor location. Oh, yeah, we're, we're done. We calculate it because we have no collision or anything. Normally, this is where we would collide and then... You know, Check do you slide along way. the wall? Oh, squash things. <laughs> Definitely, we would do all that. But in this case, since there's there's nothing to interact with in the world yet, we can just we can just be there. That's where you want to be. Okay, be there. Good. And I think we can compile this now and roll a tank around. Yes. Easy. Yeah, and so we saw last time. Okay, last time that worked. We didn't have any compile failures. I like I like to clear this log so that. Um, because there can be a lot of output from a compile process, especially yeah. on a larger thing. So I like to clear it so that if there's something like this, I see it right away. And I don't have extra screens of junk. Okay. Oh, we forgot to set the access level. Okay. Oh, on our two library functions? Yep, forgot to do that. So no problem. Um, all right, so a, a little C, uh, C++ language difference. Structs default to public access. Classes default to private access. I thought that we had um, generated body change everything to public, but that was I think prior to four six. If you still like, there's generated U class body that you'll see in older uh, projects and yeah, things, yeah. and that will do everything to public. Yeah, so I sort of got used to that, and then I got used to typing public anyway. And as you can see in all of our templates, uh, we we just it's just sort of there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so okay, we forgot to do that. No problem. Again. I know, we, this is, I'm glad that there's one animated thing on the screen. It's really thrilling. We can go ahead and make our player controller. Or do you want to wait for the code to compile? Um, hmm. All right, well, let's, let's, I do want to see the tank in motion. <laughs> I guess we could just click the buttons to have it, <clears throat> have it uh, do that. Do you just want to do a, a blueprint one for right now? Or do you want to make another? Oh, yeah, we can blueprint it. That's fine. Because I think starting kicking off another compile while that's going, we'll probably not make the engine very happy. No, we probably shouldn't. Uh, add a new blueprint. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, you're in the C++ plus. <laughs> that's, that's one of my clicked it and it didn't do what I expected. There we go. And probably between this stream and the next one, we're going to make a blueprints folder and probably. Yeah, I do like to sort things into like actors and pieces of world geometry and all oh, that kind of stuff. The compile's complete. So tank player controller better. Okay. Oh, we can. We don't actually need to use that yet because it doesn't do anything. But um... hey, it doesn't move at all. Um, okay, that's <laughs> this is this is normal programming procedure. Um, all right, what didn't we hook up? Yep. Tank input is sanitized. We know we're getting good tank input. Um. Should be running on tick. Under the log one, two, three. That's what we do. We loft, we loft things out. <laughs> All right, so somewhere in here we're doing something that's not getting through. So we like to look inside. Basically within each loop. Yeah. Or each yeah, past, logical statement. Yeah, each, loop, each point where, like, here's a choke point where something could have not happened. Um, well, really, if we get inside, oh, hey, look, if delta yaw does not equal zero, then don't do nothing never. Okay. So if we didn't need to rotate, we still might have wanted to move. Oh. I'm going to leave the debug stuff in, but I'm pretty sure that was it. Uh, we can delete the debug stuff in a little bit. Right. 
again. It'll log in compile. No okay. problem. What else are we going to do with that player controller? So that we have a mouse cursor. Oh, just so we have oh. a cursor. Yeah, yeah. But the right. compile just finished. Wow, that was way faster. Yeah. Well, we're getting inside of the two. Shelly, can you zoom in on that? All right, so when, I, so when I press the key, we're getting the one and the two. And that's fine. But the tank is still not moving. Good thing we didn't delete all the debug stuff, because we still need to check. You're good, Delta. Um, you're telling me that your speed would... We did this when we originally programmed it too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, viewers. Yeah, like the whole city. <laughs> Same person. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. So yeah. And do it just on the. Of course. Here's the blueprint. Yay. Yeah, we went through, I, I do remember going through this exact process of well, it's getting there. Okay. Yeah, it's outputting zero speed. though. That's uh. We search for speed. We should get both of them. Yes. Yep. Oh. We can't yaw orders. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what are good values for this? 20, I think 20. Well, we don't, we don't have any turning. Well, yeah, we do have turning, actually. Yeah. Um, all right, that'll be 100. 180, that'll mean it'll take us a full second to turn around. It's a tank. It's a tank. That's, that's going to feel awful if it were a car, but... What if... Well, let's give it a try. Like in the parking lot? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tiny paper tank. It's very different. All right, well, we'll get one of Mark's cars and just see how <laughs> see what the turn radius is. That will go over well. All right. <gasps> now we've got those multiple tank turrets because we moved we moved those around earlier. Yes. Thank you, Boston. Oh, you go um, zero. Is actually Miss Fizero. In Miss Fizero. No, okay, so the tank is turning and rotating. You're going in all sorts of different directions. Yes. Oh, you know what? Um, so we did make our camera orthographic, but mm -hmm. we have to change the sort axis for our camera so that we don't get the popping back and forth. Yes, we do. That's just on the project settings. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. And that's just something that the default is to make a sphere, but because we don't want there to be a sphere from the world, we just want it to always, always be sorting down the, the, Z, the Z axis. Yeah, spherical distance from the camera makes sense from a... Um, perspective camera it's just how far away are you from the camera and then whoever's closer wins mm -hmm. but in this case the orthographic like we said earlier we're, we're just looking straight straight down a line yeah. so it's whatever's closer to us on that that line that plane um, it's under rendering? yeah it should be under rendering and something like sprites translucency and sort of along the axis yeah negative one on the z is downward so that's the axis we want Probably sort by projected Z would have worked as well, but um, that would be if the camera were moving and it were, and it were an orthographic camera. Right. The camera doesn't rotate, so we don't care. And so now the turret stays on the place. And we, the we do we, have two turrets. We did bug this, right? So it's something that would yes. be weak. It's just the... Um, and my keys are totally wrong, by the way. This is the up arrow moving us this way. Down arrow moves us that way. This is the right arrow. This is the left arrow. That's, that's pretty easy to fix. Um, we could just go into the bindings and change that. For now, we're just going to like live with it. Fine. We'll, we'll fix it later. Because um, it moves. Because the, the tank part. now moves. It's got yeah. stuck in spot. In spot. Yeah, and that would be easy to fix, but it would be kind of dull. <laughs> so we're just not going to do it here. Um, all right. And so... I, I wanted to get to aiming, but I think based on time, we should maybe look at some questions, then we'll get to the aiming. Okay, yeah, let's get some questions. Stream. Oh, the aiming's. Aiming's pretty fun, but yeah, we'll do it next time. Aiming is actually a lot easier than movement, though, because um, the turret just rotates, and that's that. Yeah. Um, all and right. we can even, you know, in the code we all attach on the forums or something, attach if you guys want to go ahead and, like, get a head start on or something, because it exists. Oh. So, I just want to look at this. Are you going to look at the direction? Yeah, I just want to see what's up with... Yeah, that, that shouldn't that shouldn't have a problem. Like this problem, I just checked into this problem today with uh, with Mark and it is with Mark Audi and it is not happening in the current code. So we just happen to get like the one version of this code that does have this problem. Right. 
that auto possess. So sorry, what was the first question we're going to go for? So the first question is, is it possible to build the components parenting all in the blueprint editor? Oh, that one's good. Yay. Yeah, it was just a little... Oh, probably because over. it was a tank that was left over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it's possible to build the components all in the blueprint editor instead of having to write all the same boilerplate C++ every time. Um, so, oh, those, those, that boilerplate C++. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about Basically, to make this. all of our components here, the problem is we wouldn't then be able to manipulate them in C++ without, like, setting a reference to our tank and then... Well, then, I mean, we could still, we could still we, call functions on them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you could do what you're trying to do. Um, in fact, let, let me just see yeah. if our camera component is... Um, so, here's our camera component. Let's change the ortho width to 512. And you can tell that's way more zoomed in, right? Um, oh, guess who didn't add a post-process volume? We did. But it's like the sun is yeah, rising every time you move. It is. It's pretty great. OK, so I, I, I do kind of like that effect. It looks pretty cool. It's not appropriate to what we're doing, but it looks cool. So yeah, I guess, yeah, if you got a reference to like your pawn and then got its components, it's just you'd have to know ahead of time what components your designer has added to their tank so that you could get references to them. Oh, yes. Yeah, if, it, if it's something that you, that you as a designer just added to the thing, then um, that's not great. Technically, you can search by name, so you can tell a designer, you know, name your component this way and I'll find it, but that's kind of hacky. Um, that's not really the best way to do it. Uh, but like this camera component that we created here, we could have taken all of this junk out and just created it, and that, well, probably the attach and the set world. So, so this, we could have deleted. We could have created it, and since it's a U property, you can just edit it, like you just saw me change the ortho width. Um, so you can do that. Uh, otherwise, generally, it's like if I have, if I want to like attach like a, a piece of cloth or something to a character, I can give you an attachment point, and then the artist can attach it there, and as the character moves around, it'll work. And I can move the attachment point around, and then your cloth component or your whatever you attached will do its thing and it'll be fine. Yeah, it's just because we need the code to know about it, it's a little bit iffy to say, okay, go add it in your blueprint and then hope that it's named the same thing to reference it in code. Yeah, you can, but probably shouldn't. And yeah, your, you need your more engineer valid will checks probably not like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, it's, it's all possible. The um, next thing is access values are being called every frame and action are not. How do the action events know when the button is pressed? If it's in the hardware or if it's on the engine side or what. OK, sure. So let's have a look at, I'm just going to write a pretend function here for, there we go. All right, so yeah, because we didn't actually bind any actions. No, All right, so if we bind an action, so backing up a sec, if we bind an axis, you can see we have, um, Shelly, can you um, zoom in just a little bit so we get that, uh, that help tool tip? Yeah, I mean, just, just so it's a little more readable. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Thank you. OK, so you can see we have an axis name, and then the object that it's going to be on, and then over here, the function that it's going to call. Now, if we, I, I will move this around so that we don't have to move the screen. All right. Now, if we do a bind action, oh, no, we're good at that zoom. Sorry. I was moving it. So. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have an action name. Like fire. Fire. All right. And then we have a, a, uh, a key event. This is an enumerated type. So the really not going to tell me. All right. Well, anyway, right here, there's a thing that will say, like, uh, there's one that's like input event. There's pressed. Um, released. There's released. And I think the third one is held, which, which means that it has oh, there been. You go. Oh, Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a fourth one, yeah. So repeat um, basically means that you've held it down for long enough that you would trigger the repeat rate. And you can, you can um, uh, configure that in project settings. And then uh, double click is you've pressed it twice within a certain interval of time, which I believe you can also configure. I generally use pressed and released most of the time um, when I'm like, programming. Like jump is one of our big press release. No. Yeah, like if you had a jump, like a Mario Brothers thing, and you care about when it's pressed and you care about when it's released. Um, those are the two important important events to know about uh, with regard to that. So press release, and then and then the end of it is just the same thing. Uh, what object is it going to be on, and then and then you know what functions are going to call. Um, so yeah, you you can 
you can do that that way and that's how that's how you'll know when it happens um, without getting an update every single frame on whether or not it's pressed this frame. Uh, if you did want to know if it's pressed this particular frame though, in the function you could just store is this button down yes no as a boolean and then on your tick you could just check what the current boolean is. Okay. Um, and then is there a performance difference because if that axis is being called basically every tick and you put something heavy on that that is actually going to be... Oh don't put something heavy on that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. that's where you want the, if it is zero and you don't want anything to happen, go ahead and exit out of the function. So depending on how you implement things, there yeah. might be a difference in performance between... Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, the toughest case would probably be something like, um, like if you're aiming and you have like a, like a reticle that needs to light up when you aim it on a valid target or something like that. Um, but don't do that in the input code. Do that in your, in your tick code or in your reticles tick code or however you manage your project. Um, yeah, don't do heavy stuff in input. Input should should be pretty much just read the input, write it down. We'll clean it up and deal with it in the unified place later. Um, but right here, just record that you have it and, and go. Um, you'll notice that my function is, is one line long and it calls another function that's also one line long and we're out. Um, and the last, it looks like we're spending a lot of time writing boilerplate instead of game logic. Is it normal for the workflow? Is it just because it's a tutorial? I think also it's because it's the very beginning of the tutorial, right? Like we're still setting up our base movement and not really gotten to the game part of the zombies and the um, firing. And yeah, and a lot of it is boilerplate code also because we wanted to show, um, we wanted to show how the components can be created in code, um, which is boilerplate code if you've done it 50 times, but it's not if you've never done it before. So we're kind of showing a different approach to it. Um, Probably we wouldn't normally have done it that way. We just we just would have said like yeah, create this component, create this component, whatever, go. In fact, we didn't even need to do that with the camera. If if we were willing to have a, the camera just defined in blueprints, we really could have just gone into the the editor and stuck the camera on there and been done with it, and that would have been fine. Um, we just did it to show how to do it. Yeah, if you wanted to only make your camera in C plus plus, this is what you'd call. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's. Does that cover most of what we're getting here? Yeah, and also I think we're yeah we're taking the time to like write out a lot of the things that we would you know copy and paste. We're just duplicating the component ourselves. Yeah, this is faster to type out when you're actually doing it than when you're explaining it and typing things wrong and forgetting how to spawn pawns and things like that. Like <laughs> that that adds time to the process. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of cut and paste, and once you've done this once or twice, you'll end up you'll end up with this boilerplate stuff. That you just go yeah, copy this. Okay, over here. And this camera's this angle. Okay, we're done. Um, it ends up being quick, but yeah, this is this is the setup phase. And we're kind of looking forward for certain things, like oh, we know at some point we might want to override this in our blueprint. So let's go ahead and mark it up, rather than just us kind of knowing where we're heading in in the long run. Yeah, there's there's some amount of that going on too. Um, we didn't do too much of it, but um, you know, normally when you program and you kind of know you're going to have something that's going to come in later. Like I would normally have set up a collision component here because I know eventually my tank is going to need it. Um, I just didn't today because I'm, I'm trying to walk through the process just step by step and not act like I know what's coming five steps down. Yeah, it's more just like future proofing, right? Like mm -hmm. going in and exposing the camera to blueprints so that we could tweak it if we wanted to. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, there is this little bit of setup time, but if you look at this, we've actually done this in under, in what, under two hours while talking through it, uh, which is pretty slow compared to just writing it. Um, really not that bad and we're and we're getting near the point where we can actually write game code. Okay. And looks like we'll probably get to aiming in the next stream, but then we'll also add firing and things chasing us and it'll be exciting. Oh that's gonna be fun. Yes. Yeah that's 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 the fun part. That's what you that's what you really work towards. Well that's Shelly very nice we get lots of exploding transitions for that one. Because... Is that when you're gonna add Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have something for this. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Oh no it's oh. Zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah we did we did have a request for zombie smushing also. Yes. So I think we'll have to do that. Was that Michael Nolan? Yes, it was. Of course and we'll it was. go. We'll make sound effects for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gross sounds coming up. Yes. Well, thanks to everybody for tuning in. And um, definitely if you have any other questions or when we figure out the thing about the pond, we'll put that back up on the forums and also the code that we wrote today so you guys can oh, yeah. um, check out check that out when you're working along with this video later. Yes, and remember that you're going to have to fix those axes because we didn't do it in the stream today. Yes. But um, that would be a good exercise. It's not that hard to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Bye, everybody.